Great. So should we begin or what do you say? I'll get to where I will. Okay, wonderful. So we are gonna start. Um, I will introduce the session, introduce myself, then I'll just give a little bio on you and then you can start um, Bijikin, followed by Loretta, then uh, Anaqua. Is that okay? So I think just because, and then I can sit down and the focus could be on you. Because as you can see, this is what is showing. <laughs> So welcome, everyone. Recording. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here with us today and for this panel. Hi, Chris. Good to see you. Um, so just want to make sure this is the food sovereignty everyone is here for. So my name is Maria Moreno, and I represent the Earth Partnership Program. Uh, we have three initiatives. Uh, briefly, we have a Latino Earth Partnership in which we work in, uh, in Puerto Rico on dune restoration and mangrove restoration and turtle monitoring. Uh, we have a global one in which we've worked in Mexico and in Ecuador and some other countries in Latin America. But the um, initiative that really brings me here is the Indigenous Arts and Sciences. And these are some of our partners that you see on the screen and are on this panel. And I just wanna say a little bit about our Indigenous Arts and Sciences, a collaboration with the Native Nations of Wisconsin, of which is six, Bad River, Red Cliff, Black du Flambeau, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and Lakota Ray. And our collaboration is rooted on respect, relationship, reciprocity, and, uh, and responsibility. And we address the needs for culturally relevant learning and experience and career explorations of youth in these communities in the context of environmental education. So that's what Earth Partnership is. If you anybody wants any more information, I'd be happy to share or um, we can continue the conversation later. Uh, but in terms of this panel, this one is on food sovereignty thriving in Wisconsin. And we'll be hearing from um, our, our colleagues from Bad River and Menominee. And there are numerous initiatives underway across Wisconsin that promote food sovereignty, its cultivation and consumption. This panel brings native voices to the conversation from its integration into the classroom to its philosophical perspective and the efforts to re-indigenize communities relationship with food. The emphasis is on how food, Sovereignty promotes and nurtures cultural traditional practices, how it reconnects with and builds strong relationships with plant families, and through this practice feeds and sustains community in a healthy way. And I, I hope that that's what you get from this panel. I know that in conversation and preparation for it, that was a conversation we were having. Um, all four of us. So, and I want to specifically thank the panelists for agreeing to take their time um, to participate in this. And I'll just give you a little background on them, but they will introduce themselves more deeply. So Dylan Jennings um, uh, Biji Keen uh, is currently resides in Odana with his family and it's a University of Wisconsin-Madison Heal Doctoral Fellow. So he is he has done most all of his degrees at UW Madison and he has worked with the Earth Partnership since his undergraduate days here at UW. He served as the director of the public information for the Great Lakes Indian and Fish and Wildlife Commission, that is Glyphwick, if you've ever heard of that word. And he recently served as an appointed member of the Wisconsin Governor's Task Force on climate change. And um, Dylan has also collaborates with us in um, undergraduate teaching here at UW with our freshman interest group and our restoration education courses. Um, he did a beautiful um, Manuman wild rice workshop for our students. Um, that was, you know, as the students say, was gave them the opportunity to experience what um, the preparation of wild rice how the preparation of wild rice was a practice that is part, that is community, community infused, that it's not just something where, you know, typical of how we prepare rice at home, at least in my case. Loretta Livingston is um, from Bad River uh, and is a tribal member there. She's the program coordinator for the Bad River Food Sovereignty Program, a graduate of Northland College. She received her degree from UW Madison Law School, so an alumni, and she has practiced exclusively in tribal courts for the last 20 years. Guy Richter is from, is, uh, is from Menominee. He's executive director of the Menominee Indian Community Organization, Minish Kainakin. He's a community organizer, 
activist, author, amateur archaeologist, lecturer, and he organizes events that uplift the human condition and demonstrate the richness of Menominee culture. I think he would have been a welcome guest this morning in some of the conversations we had in some of the presentations. So just I want to invite you all to listen to them. They We've talked about following a, uh, a rhythm, so I will sit down and let them take over. So welcome. Boso, Boso and Buju. Anin, am I out first? Is that how it goes? I got 15 yes, minutes. Yes, it is. All right. Anin, good kid, Aliyah. Nitsa, Bijakin, Sindishin, Akaz, Wabashashi, and Dodem, Mashkazibing, and Dunjaba, Nimigochuan, Makinago, Ginoa, and Gapi, Jayagoma, Sanungum. We need a Shama, Paneguna, Nimikuna, Mongo, and you. A kinna, Oasia, Indashkaye, Kinna, Awenji, Bimata, Ziang, Ma, Indashkaye, and you Jaganashi, Bongi. My name is Bija Keats. Um, thank you for that introduction. I also want to give a shout out to my relatives here, Anaquit and uh, Loretta, uh, two, two individuals that I very much look up to in our communities and really excited for, for their part of the talk. And, um, you know, I know they probably had me go first because I'm like the hors d'oeuvres if we're talking in food terms and they're more like the main course. So uh, I'm just going to give you a little, little kickoff, a little taste of something, and um, they, they're going to have some amazing things to share with you all. Um, like uh, Marie was talking about to us, you know, the, the notion of food sovereignty transcends um, into the relationships that we have with everything um, in creation. And um, it's, uh, it's even um, apparent within our language systems how we revere and understand our place and who we are. Um, in many of our languages, we don't have words for things like natural resources, right, which kind of evoke it's a basic connotation of um, essentially, essentially um, commercialization or, um, you know, just kind of aesthetics or, or any other types of usage. Um, to us, these relationships are very much a part of who we are and how and the things that we need to maintain. Um, you know, word we might use, and a lot of people have heard me say this, is wenjibimatiziang, which is literally means from where we get life. And so we recognize even within our language and our understanding of place and who we are, um, that all of these beings that we revere as beings give us life and, um, and continue to do so. It's not something that's just antiquated and in the past. Um, they continue to sustain us and take care of our communities and our communities continue to follow these ways and, um, and practice these things. And I'm just going to give a brief PowerPoint here um, um, about... Just a, just a little bit about history, but also about just work being done, um, you know, in different different um, educational educational settings, and um, and it's called the the beings that sustain us. These are some just old old uh, news clippings um, from from our community, from our area up here, um, Biodena. Um, and these, it's important to understand history to understand where we're at today, right? We all know that a lot of our communities have undergone hundreds of years of forced assimilation, um, colonization, and uh, it's important for us to talk about those things and really understand um, what that looked like. Um, and on the left here, here's is an old clipping from um, a newspaper called the Odena Star that used to be in our community back in the early 1900s. Um, this is from 1914, I think, the year 1914. And it's talking about a fair, um, a big fair that was going to be held for like the second second year in a row. And if you read part of that article, it talks about the basic intent of that fair um, was to spur agriculture within our within our community. And so to get our community to kind of, you know, remove ourselves from some of our traditional harvesting practices, but to kind of dive into um, you know, what was revered as mainstream agricultural practices, or what um, oftentimes the government revered as, as, a, as a, a simple way for our communities to, to assimilate um, and to, to blend into American society. Um, and so essentially, you know, this, we look at just some basic, basic historical um, dates, right? A lot of our communities all throughout the United States or present day United States um, undergo removal oftentimes um, in the early 1830s. Ojibwe communities were also um, not immune to that as well. There were also forced removal attempts um, on the government's part um, onto our Ojibwe community, specifically around the 1850s. 
um, where we end up with things like the Sandy Lake tragedy. And there are a couple other um, incidents that happen after that. Um, also things through like allotment. Um, and, and all of these practices have one thing very, very much in common, um, land diminishment. Um, in, in a way, a lot of communities like ours are, you know, losing some of our ancestral grounds where we would traditionally harvest from, where we would traditionally sustain our families, sustain our communities. And so, you know, that's a, that's a very important to understand that uh, despite all of the things that our people and our communities have had to endure, right, our communities are still very much alive, um, resilient, and, and moving forward. Another thing, obviously, is the boarding school era or era where, um, you know, schools were um, erected into in our communities, um, you know, specifically in our community, uh, we didn't have a government funded boarding school, but we had St. Mary's uh, Church School, which was put up in 1883. Um, so that paired with the, the notion of right suppression, um, make it very difficult for our communities to um, essentially express and be who we are when it comes to maintaining that relationship with all of those beings um, and that relationship with those sacred foods. And so, you know, our community signed uh, treaties back in the 1800s, um, which essentially were land session treaties, giving um, the United States access to millions of acres of land in exchange for um, commodities, um, other, other resources, provisions, um, money, and also use of fructory rights. So the ability to harvest within those lands that were ceded to the federal government. Um, but in the mid 1900s, after, um, after many years have passed, um, the states that are now states within those areas begin to suppress those rights um, and essentially um, bar many of our tribal harvesters from, um, from being who we are, right? And being able to harvest the things that we need to harvest um, and, and essentially um, take care of our communities. And so that's a very, very, very crucial pieces of history right there. And so things that I'm really interested in, how do we, how do we reverse some of the damage that's been done through colonization, um, through colonizing of our, our food systems, through erosion of our food systems? Um, you think that at that point in time when a lot of those treaties were signed and even prior to um, when we had contact with non-Native communities, um, there was introduction of foods that um, we still have to this day that probably aren't the healthiest for us, right? Things like exchange of uh, white flour, uh, molasses, um, sugar, um, all these, you know, not, 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 not very natural things that um, have really helped to erode some of our traditional food systems. Um, and so one thing we've been really working on and really diligent in working with other communities on is developing seasonally based curriculum. You know, and this is just one, one, uh, one thing that's that's aimed at helping to address this this uh, kind of predicament that that we're in, and uh, what that entails is developing seasonally based curriculum um, within any any given season within any given region, and understanding you know and learning from our knowledge holders, learning from our elders, our harvesters, um, our community members that maintain those knowledge systems truly understanding um, how significant and important those things are and what types of skills our young people and our community members should have um, to, to be able to either produce their own foods, um, to maintain those relationships with those beings, um, or to, to simply um, be uh, um, a, a community member that's, that's able to, to be productive and, and help in, in many different respects. And so, um, you know that that's that's really what what you know I've I've spent a lot of my time helping to to develop and do within other communities and this is a good example. Those are some pictures um, of a, a Wawashkeshi Gabeshu and a deer camp that we hold um, in the Odawa Gayaguning community of Lakuta Ray. Um, and so you know every year uh, we we help out with a camp over there and we're just getting ready to go do that in a day or two here. And uh, essentially, students spend days outdoors um, helping, learning about, you know, that relationship we have with Bawashkeshi, those deer, um, learning about, you know, how we respectfully and ethically in our, in our ways, in our teachings, our understanding, um, harvest those ones, um, and how we take care of and, and, uh, and process those ones in a respectful and good way. And then, of course, how we cook them, right, without having to add, um, you know, 
an inch or two of salt or of different different types of things, right? We we try to try to teach you know um, you know food sob to the max, right? Teaching how to how to cook with some of our very simple but but amazing ingredients that that are just given to us here on our, in our, on our earth and um, and cooking those types of things over the fire. And this uh, these types of camps that we've helped start up in many different communities have been uh, very helpful very helpful in many, many respects. I know that Bad River has one coming up this co next coming next weekend, I believe. Um, and there, there are things like this going on all over the place. <clears throat> and when we've worked with, um, you know, school districts or wherever it might be, you know, there's also, um, you get the question, right? Well, how does this fit into what we're trying to do, right? Like almost as if sometimes there's, um, there are walls put up, right? And curriculum is curriculum and food sob is food sob. When really, you know, to, to many of us, we believe that it all should be able to be one, especially when you consider a lot of the, the um, a lot of the STEM and other, other, um, um, other kinds of, um, you know, academic, academic rigor that goes into understanding these seasons and these processes. Um, and this is just an example, right? When we talk about deer season, um, and harvesting deer or trapping, that's the time for us to also talk about the, the biology of that animal, right? Also the, um, the anatomy of that animal, understanding the anatomy in both um, English, the scientific language, and also our languages, right? Which are very important. Also understanding that life cycle and the, the process of, um, of life and, and how that how the animal is, is used in those, in those ways. And so there are a lot of different ways that we've worked with educators to kind of tie those standards, you know, or tie those activities to existing standards or to just create our own types of standards, right, where we, where we can. And for us, it's very much about hands-on learning, uh, making sure our young people feel um, they're being nourished in their identity, right, making sure that, um, you know, they're attaining these really important life skills that um, are, are meaningful and impactful within our communities. Um, they're also a means to promote food security, right? And, and things like climate resiliency, being able to adapt to things that, are, that we're seeing in our everyday climate. Um, they're also about building long-term community well-being and health um, and addressing a lot of those health disparities that um, we hear about within our communities. And then obviously preserving our language and culture. So there's a lot of that involved in, in with all these these activities that we're we're working towards. And in kind of closing, talking about this is just one example, and I realize these presentations are very fast, even kind of scratch the surface of all this. But um, for us, a lot of these activities, there's that the relationship, like I talk about. And so for us as Anishinaabeg, uh, we have all these different cultural rites of passage that are important for our young people and building their identity and building who they are. Um, and an example of that is our Oshkinatagewin, or our first kill ceremonies that um, are had when a young person um, essentially takes that first life, whether it's a fish, a deer, a wabus, um, any of those, any of those ones. Um, it's really not about the act of um, taking life. It's more or less about the ability to be a provider, a provider within your community, the ability to take care of others in your community and maintain that relationship of reciprocity that we have with everything within our environment. And so, you know, when we, when we still see these practices done, you know, and that connection that you have, watch these young people, you know, become adults through these important and significant rites of passage. Um, it's, it's a really, it's a really good thing. It's uh, something that I think a lot of our communities are very and extremely proud of. Um, and so that's just that's just an example of how that how that manifests. And like I said, that's that's a very quick example. And I don't want to take up too much time. I know I only had had a few minutes to uh, to uh, go before our, our next presentation. So I want to say, Miomenik Manwewe Tuyan Migwich Bizendawieg. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Go ahead, Loretta. You are muted. You're still muted. 
Loretta. Okay. Bonjour. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Loretta Livingston, and I am, as I it was, as I was introduced, I'm the coordinator for the food sovereignty program here in the Bad River uh, community. Um, and I am happy to have this opportunity to speak to you today about the program. Uh, I believe it's important to uh, build an understanding among other individuals and groups of people about food. Uh, food is life and food is fun. Uh, food describes our relationship to each other and to the land that we live on. Um, anyway, without getting too deep, uh, but as a way to provide um, some explanation about the title of this presentation, uh, Native Food Sovereignty as an Inherent Philosophy. It's kind of a mouthful there. Uh, it's, a, it's a belief, it's my belief that the people of Bad River and probably very similarly other reservations, other indigenous peoples are born with a sense of connection to the land on which they live. The land provided and provides food, medicines and other means to survive. In my community, I believe that it is incumbent upon the local government to provide opportunities, training, what have you, uh, to the young people in order that they can uh, interpret and internalize that connection uh, to make uh, sense about a way of life that revolves around food and uh, around the land that provides food and medicines. Of course, uh, that. I don't mean to just say the youth, but everyone in the community needs to learn or relearn uh, that connection or acknowledge uh, the value of that, of that way of life. Uh, when I assumed the position of program coordinator, I had a vision for the types of activities that food sovereignty should be involved in and ideas for events to host through my program. I had been involved in the food sovereignty program for about five years prior to um, taking over in 2017. At one point, there was a committee of community members, all who had experiences with different aspects of food sovereignty and had different food related skills. We had intended to uh, form a nonprofit organization separate from the tribal government in terms of being responsible for our own hiring and, and management of whatever effort we were going to uh, proceed with under the nonprofit. We didn't get to that point yet, uh, but it's still out there as, as a possibility. Um, at the point, I'm sorry, I didn't turn off my phone. Um, at the point that I took over the position, um, the program had the program had two high tunnels in operation with one high tunnel used primarily for educational activities involving youth. Uh, youth from the local Boys and Girls Club uh, were a constant uh, attendees at our events here. Um, there were also uh, two other garden areas in the community that grew vegetables or medicines. Uh, there were four large raspberry gardens or garden beds on site. There were some fruit trees uh, like plum, cherry, apple, and there were plans to farm on land um, approximately 25 miles, 20 miles, excuse me, outside the reservation boundaries that had been willed to the tribe. So there was a lot of, there were a lot of activities, a lot of ideas flowing. Uh, the program is currently housed in an old school building made up of six trailers put together. Uh, the, build, the building is still used today. That's the building I'm sitting in. There are plans for a new building. We have received a grant for a new building. That's going to be less than half the size of what we have now. Um, so prior to my role as coordinator, there had been uh, a lot of uh, discussion about the many directions that this program could take and the activities in which we could engage. One idea was a dine and learn. Another one was the development of a small cafe on the premises uh, using or offering food that was grown on site and locally. Other discussions were about fishing on Lake Superior, how to process fish, for example, smoking fish. The uh, other ideas were hunting and processing of venison, uh, growing our own food, processing good uh, 
and how do we process the food that's grown, uh, canning, dehydrating, freezing, that kind of thing, and providing training to community members to grow their own food in their own, bar in their own backyards and in community gardens. So anyone who is new to gardening or growing their own food or harvesting even traditional plants or medicines are many times taken aback by the amount of work involved, by the time it takes away uh, from the work that you need to do to support your families, time constraints and the, the challenge of scheduling time to sort out the day, the day problems of family, school, children, work are, are all impediments or challenges to growing your own food. So we had discussions on that as well. So I've been an amateur garden for, gardener for much of my life. Uh, I say amateur because I did not embrace the whole concept of food sovereignty as a way of life. Uh, until I became involved in the activities of this program. And it's been a life-changing experience for me. Um, and I wanted to, I want to share that with, you know, with the community. So currently uh, we have three high tunnels in operation. We have a like 30 by 25 foot garden that, are, that is adjacent to the, the high tunnels. There are four community gardens in the area that each contain five to six raised beds in each of them that are available uh, to community members. If a community member uh, does take advantage of being able of growing food in one of the plots, we provide uh, garden tools, uh, workbench space, water source, a hand washing station, and we offer beginning gardening classes. So historically, um, in terms of my tenure with the program, um, we have been fortunate in receiving equipment donations from a variety of tribal and non-tribal sources. Uh, with COVID funds, for example, we were able to purchase a tractor. Uh, the housing authority uh, purchased the third high tunnel for our program. The hunger task force uh, purchased new plastic and poles for our old high tunnels. Uh, Great Lakes Senior Tribal Council program purchased uh, equipment on at least three occasions, such as two upright smokers, meat grinders, sausage making equipment and materials, canning supplies. And all of these uh, e equipment and supplies are available for use not only by our program, but community members at our site. One year we received, or two years running, we received donation of pigs from a local non-tribal farmer that we butchered on site uh, that was processed and packaged by the local uh, tribal store. The bacon and hams were smoked using said equipment that I mentioned on site and were just hand delivered to many community members, including tribal elders. Again, historically and currently, uh, we have hosted a number of uh, food related dine and learn events, beginning with um, a class taught by a gifted tribal member who demonstrated how to process bear fat. How to use that bear fat to make medicinal salves using traditional and common plants, and even a beauty product class using uh, purified bear fat to make eye creams, sugar scrubs, lip balms, et cetera. So when I said earlier that it was a life-changing experience, it was because what we need in our lives is provided in our, our own backyards and the landscape around us. Um, so, Another example of that is when I go shopping uh, for like we at our dine and learns, we have a traditional meal. Well, not traditional meal so much as a meal that uh, uses the produce that we grow on site or that we purchase lo from local organic farmers. So when I go into the grocery store today, I see, you know, I see aisles and aisles of, of products that I don't want to use. I go, where's the good stuff? Where's the organic stuff? Um, Where's the stuff that, you know, I know where it came from. I know there are no pesticides used in its growth. I know there are no um, unknown ingredients in that food source. So it's really changed my life. And it's, um, it's something that I want to share with more and more community members. Um, I was talking about bear fat. The fourth class that we didn't have an opportunity to hold was the cooking class, cooking with bear fat. Um, I've heard that it's, it's, it makes a really delicious pie crust. You can use it to you know, cook potatoes, fry potatoes, that, that sort of thing. I know I do have a personal experience with bear fat 
I mentioned raspberry beds earlier. Uh, there's four of them and they have to be weeded every so often. And I was doing it myself one day and it's like the bugs were just atrocious. The mosquitoes were just eating me alive. So I said, hey, I have bear fat. So I came in the building, rubbed myself down my ears and everything with bear fat, went out there two and a half hours, got it done. No problem with mosquitoes or, or insects bothering me. Uh, so it's just, it's just an all, want, all around wonderful, wonderful opportunity to be able to host a program where we can process bear meat bear fat rather and make salves and and uh, medicinal uh, salves to, that address things like arthritis, eczema, and offer those to the community. We have we engage in maple syrup gathering and um, we make our own maple syrup on site. Uh, we do participate in some of the other community uh, wild rice harvests harvests rather, excuse me. Uh, I've recently purchased through grant opportunities uh, equipment to process our own wild rice here. Uh, I have a thrasher, wild rice thrasher that's uh, en route. I have uh, I purchased big tubs so that we can um, harvest the, the wild rice. We have a fanner that we can use to harvest wild rice. Um, we have our own bees here. We've, this is the first year that we've harvested honey from our own bees. Anytime we grow or plant any of our crops here, we, we sing a, a song in Ojibwe before we put the seed in the ground. When we harvest wild plants, we offer our tobacco and thanks. Some of those, th those are some of the things that uh, have been talked about by Lisa Keens earlier, and I'm sure that will be reiterated by Anaquat. Uh, we, one thing I didn't mention is that we have our own tea garden here. We have we grow spearmint, lemon balm, and peppermint and bee balm. We gather uh, wild or traditional plants such as uh, sweet clover, Labrador, white pine, sumac, mullen. We grow some mullen on, on site. Uh, on site, we also grow stevia, which is really not a, a, a traditional plant. In fact, I think it comes from the Amazon, but it's able to grow here in our climate. In, especially in the high tunnels. We use that as a sweetener. Uh, it doesn't have the same effect on, on the body as regular white sugar would have. Uh, we use maple syrup that we process here as a sweetener. We use honey, again, harvested from our own bees. We harvest rose hips, hawthorn berries, and all of these uh, uh, teas and plants that I mentioned, they all have medicinal qualities used to address all the different ailments um, that um, might be encountered by our community members. For example, hawthorn berries is known to regulate uh, heart, uh, your heart problems. Uh, rose hips as a, as a wonderful source of vitamin C. Sumac is a wonderful source of vitamin C. Uh, white pine is a wonderful source of vitamin C. Uh, it's, it's just been a, a, a life-changing experience for me to uh, be a part and be a coordinator of this program. And I, I retain the title of coordinator because I coordinate a lot of the activities that take place here and I collaborate with other tribal programs that uh, engage in uh, traditional activities um, like the, the cultural camps in the past. Um, another thing that I didn't mention is that or maybe I did mention it. There's a, we call it Ursula's farm. It's 20, it's about a mm, little under 20 acres. It's a farm that was willed to the tribe about 20 years ago. And we're starting to uh, utilize the, the pasture lands there. Uh, I had a, another life lesson when uh, we, we divided like a three acre par parcel pasture around the house, the old house there, into like seven um, plots. They were like 100 by 110 feet fenced in. Uh, the first year we planted like the Three Sisters Garden, we did the corn, squash, that kind of thing. And um, I learned a, a hard lesson because farming is a lot different than gardening. We had a tractor, so we were able to plant, uh, but the, the drought hit that year, two years ago, and we didn't have a very successful harvest. So we changed 
we changed uh, what we plant there. We plant, we now plant uh, in that same space, hazelnut trees, choke cherry trees, and some plum trees, and some uh, related plants that attract bees, butterflies, and other beneficial insects. We have an opportunity. Uh, we, again, talking about collaboration. I joined a, a grant submission with UW Extension. And if we, we are we're included in their grant, so potentially we could plant up to 3,000 acres of hazelnut trees. And we would have access to the local hazelnut uh, uh, processing plant at the local college, Northland College, and then we could distribute those to um, the community members. We're also looking at a grant opportunity that would hire four more workers uh, that we would train over a period of three years, and we would further um, expand our um, production, food production on site and at Ursula's farm. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, I didn't realize how many things we did here uh, until I started putting it, you know, pen to paper or started typing up some sort of presentation for today. I hope you found this information informative um, and I feel very lucky to be able to, to share our experience with uh, non-tribal people so that they can understand uh, us as an indigenous people, as people who have this connection to the land and who, are, who, have, who value um, our connection to the land, uh, so much so that we are making additional efforts um, to help our members learn and relearn what it means to uh, be sovereign as far as food. Um, so I assume that we will have some time for questions at the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, Loretta, we'll save thank the you. questions for the end. Yeah, thank you. And now we'll have uh, Anakwa, please take the floor. Also, Anakwit Natakam, Wapashia Nitotam, Kashitna Nitskiwakian, Waiwan and Mawani Wayaka Yosa Itua. My uh, English name is uh, Guy Ryder. My, uh, my real name is Anakwit. Uh, I'm the executive director of uh, an organization located on the uh, uh, Manami Indian Reservation uh, by the name of Mini Konakim. And that roughly kind of translates to um, the good, good village builders, um, maybe rebuilders, I should say. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about um, just our how we kind of got started as an organization and, and how it pertains to food sovereignty. Um, we uh, currently operate a 80 acre uh, buffalo ranch. Uh, we were just um, able to bring back home uh, uh, our relative. Um, last week, as a matter of fact, uh, we brought home 10, 10 animals um, to our ranch. And, and uh, the, the idea or the dream behind it was, was really uh, reconnecting with that animal. And, and uh, the buffalo used to be a part of our, our medicine lodge and, and uh, was a part of our culture. Um, at one time and, and through our trials and tribulations as a tribe, you know, a lot of that knowledge and a lot of that um, understanding has, has, has slowly kind of um, walked away from us, but we're, we're calling back again on that knowledge and, and on those ones. And hopefully that this uh, beautiful relative of ours will help us to, to jog our memories uh, of our relationship. But that's the, the, the approach we kind of um, have been using at Mini Konakim is, is really to remind ourselves of this relationship, this beautiful uh, re reciprocal relationship that we have, not only with, with uh, our plant brothers and sisters, but also uh, animals and all those things that make up our, our environment. You know, our people uh, were masters of, of their environment and, and were very keen and you know, wise when it came to to stuff they were stuff they were growing and how they were harvesting, um, that sort of idea has always been um, a part of of Mini Konakim and in our approach, um, especially when it came to to growing seeds. You know, before before we even um, you know chose to to plant any kind of seeds, um, you know, we feasted the land first and. 
and uh, had a, a sunrise ceremony there and, and um, just let that land know because the the 80 acres that we we have gotten um, used to be a farm and they used you know chemicals and those things and we we definitely don't want to do that or or, uh, um, or anything like that so we uh, feasted that land and, and um, wanted to let it know that like we're here to you know work with it and 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 you know, do things in a good way from our heart. And, uh, you know, culturally our, our people, you know, would follow that, um, follow that sort of approach. And, and also they, there were a lot of keys, um, you know, in the, in the environment that would tell you when it was time to either plant or when it was time to harvest and those things. And uh, our people, you know, paid attention to that. And they paid attention to those, uh, those birds, you know, flying south or, or they're coming back north or whatever whatever they're doing were, were very good indicators, um, you know, on, on when it was time to do certain things. And of course the, the celestial, uh, um, what was also the, the stars and moon and played a, a big role in it as well. Um, but the, the important part I wanted to, to really uh, touch on was, is just getting that uh, when we, as an example of what I'm trying to say is when we would plant, you know, we would bring all those seeds of ours that we were going to plant that year and we'd bring them on a table. We would smudge them off. Uh, we would talk to them. You know, we started, uh, we would pray, of course. Uh, we would also uh, sing, sing some songs to them. And really, uh, we would sing uh, encouragement songs to, to uh, encourage them to do their work. You know, and uh, we were going to do our part and, and try to help them uh, be successful um, in their in their environment and, and uh, you know, work with the, our beautiful grandfather, son, and, and uh, that Nepeo Atuk, you know, that, that water too, um, as this uh, uh, amazing team, you know, working together to, to give this little seed, this little one here, all the things it needs to be successful and uh, fight through the struggles of that soil and, and come out and reach up, you know, for the sky. So that, that kind of approach is the way we, we went about it and, um, you know, as we planted too, you know, there's always prayers and, and um, you know, a lot of that uh, connection to, to that plant. And, you know, we would sing to those plants um, for like, I don't know, a couple of weeks, um, you know, just to make sure that, that they heard us and they, and they understood. And, um, you know, when we first started, there would be people that would take turns doing that. And I remember coming out to the field and seeing our little corn plants and our other plants and there'd be somebody, you know, playing Elvis Presley or, you know, they would be playing all kinds of music. Some would be singing songs on the drum, of course. And it was just a uh, real amazing to see. And, and I uh, uh, was really, really uh, taken back by that. And, um, you know, the important part for me when I work with plants or, or when I'm around them, you know, was one of their greatest gifts is to, to remind us to, to slow down as a people, you know, they're, the way that they operate is very, very slow. And, and um, I always try to remind ourselves, remind our crew and remind everybody that's, that's uh, you know, working as we should, we should slow down and, and try to be, you know, in that moment when we're, whether we're, our fingers are, are in the soil or, you know, you're, you're um, removing some un unwanted uh, plants that are close by, um, whatever it is you're doing, you know, to try to remind yourself to, to, be in the moment and, and really connect with those plants. And we also think uh, too of, of, you know, how these little plants, how these little relatives of ours are, are gonna benefit our community and be benefit uh, our people, um, you know, so that that too, you know, is, is a part of the way in which we approach things. Uh, you know, our, our people had a very special connection with, with all our, natural foods. I heard my younger brother talk about that, a passus, you know, that, that deer and, um, you know, as it's coming up here on hunting, hunting time and, you know, that, that connection to that animal of our people, you know, we have a story of when we first came in contact with it and we had, it, it goes back just as far as we do as, as a people, um, as does uh, everything in our environment um, that's, that's on here, Turtle, that's from Turtle Island. We have stories and we have the cultural knowledge um, of, of uh, those uh, relatives of ours. And, you know, sometimes that can get kind of lost in the, 
and the um the whole movement you know is is to me that such the such a important part is is that understanding of of the story of that plant or of that animal and our connection and the way in which we see it you know we're lucky enough here uh, um to to uh have some folks in our in our reservation that's been revitalizing our language and, and doing lots of really amazing work in that regard where we're able to understand exactly the way our people seen and um you know worked with with our uh, environment through our language and you know it, it's amazing to hear my little brother and and also others you know who speak to speak our languages and to hear that talk you know it's all in there it explains everything um you know that we're talking about and, and the way in which our approach is and, and the things we do um so the 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 environment in which we're a part of you know is not just something that's outside of us or it's just uh something that we see um but it also is a part of who we are and and some of my my earlier work that i i worked with uh dr overstreet um here on the Menominee indian reservation and we were doing and also uh, Dr. Bill Gartner um, from UW Madison, who's a, um, a soil uh, soil guy, to say the least. Um, but uh, you know, we were trying to understand how our our old people, you know, were growing food and and uh, what they were growing in these prehistoric garden beds that we not only have here on the reservation, but in other places, you know, in our ancestral homeland. And you know, we did lots of things, took a lot of samples and dug in a lot of dirt and, and did a lot of surveying and did all that hard work. But um, really, you know, the data just showed that, you know, our people um, were, were masters of, of gardening and of growing food and they could have, they could grow food anywhere, um, whether it even be on a blacktop or, or you know, any of these man-made structures. That's how in touch and tune our people were with the soil and and with the land and you know we try to take that approach too you know we try to take the way we grow food um is the same way that we try to interact with our our youth and uh you know these things like my brother and my my sister here have talked about is, is they're all interconnected you know all these all these things we're talking about and i don't know if that word food sovereignty is is the best word to be using because it it's not one of our words and uh you know, there's there's better words to describe what we're doing and in, in, in the way we approach things, and um, you know that that connection with our environment is is extremely important and has always been um, very important. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just wrap up and just say that I'm I'm thankful, you know, for for being invited here, being able to sit on this panel and talk just for a few mo moments about this relationship. Um, that I feel is so important to our, our environment and to our people and to our culture. Uh, I think it, a lot of it, it entails, you know, slowing down and, and taking that time um, every day to, to be thankful of, of not only um, of our environment and, and the animals, but also um, of the water. And the water is so important. Um, and I thank the UW Madison and all the organizers of these, these events that can put our, uh, Put our minds together and we can come here and talk about these things so i'm really appreciative and uh that's about all i got Bye -bye. thank you anaqua thank you loretta thank you dylan Jikin. uh we'll open it up for questions q a um for the next 10 minutes um sure okay question so I just want to say, reiterate, um, Loretta, I support the whole bear butter idea. So I also used, I was recommended to use bear butter for mosquitoes when we were up there during our um, teacher institute. So I'm a big, you know, people, when I told people down here about it, they were like, where did you get that idea? I'm like, I don't know. I was given bear butter. It works. I'm going to continue using it. I'm not gonna put the all that spray that kills everything else, including my own skin. And just to reinforce, you know, this notion of food, it's food sovereignty, I mean, whatever you wanna call it, but it's as Anaquat was talking about, this is about a way of life. And I just, once again, wanna go back to Bijikin uh, did a dinner for our, we did an inter, um, a lang inter tribal 
no, um, the three land grant institutions had a course in um, up in Bad River, and we had eight students from UW go up there and eight students from UW Whitewater. And um, Dylan invited us to his house for dinner and he had wild rice with berries. He had walleye. Um, and there was some, uh, the juice was either sumac or hibiscus, I can't remember. But then he went to explain, you know, he harvested the rice, he foraged the, the berries, he's um, fished, he, he, for the fish and the students, you know, just like when they, when you talk about food and what food means to you. So it's not just about eating something. You are actually, it's a cultural experience. And I don't know. I mean, it was, it was really impactful for the whole group. And, you know, when we went back uh, to the hotel, just talking about it, the students were like, you know, that's what that means. Like why this is important. It's not just about eating rice with berries. It's not just about eating fish. It's about something that has meaning beyond the food itself, like it's, it, and the way it's done. So it's all tied together and the language. Um, so, you know, thank you. Can't, I can't, I always keep bringing that back just because I think for me, personally for me was a real moment of like, you know, it's, it's, it all came together. Um, so please, if you have any questions for them, um, Anyone? Just express our gratitude. Yeah, they, yeah. They can't hear me, so. They, oh, they said, thank you. Um, thank you, the gratitude for being with us. I know, so, you know, we have um, Bijou Keen and Loretta up at, are up at Bad River, um, and Anaquat is in Menominee. So it's, you know, how do you, thank you to Zoom, right? That we can yeah. bring them in, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, but anyone, um, you know, while Berries is here, so, you know, we're speaking your language, um, mm -hmm. the way that uh, Anaquad express what he does and why he does it, uh, and the pride that he feels is very much in tune with what we heard this morning. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's more than just about spousing an idea that is now popular, right? The whole food time. It's really about who you are as a person, as a community, uh, what you're passing on to that next generation and our work with the native uh, communities. I think, for, you know, as a Latina, I feel like every time I come back, I feel like, oh my God, you know, this is, it reinforces the importance of community for me. I don't have it here in Madison. Um, mine is pretty, a little bit on the far, you know, it's uh, pretty far away from here, but nonetheless, I always feel that it's thankful that I'm, you know, yes, yes. Okay, you're going to have to repeat it. Food sovereignty. So, okay, they can pick it up. Okay, food sovereignty feels like it's an all or nothing endeavor that you have to go out and forage or start your own organic gardens and, you know, basically change your whole life to this. How can you support food sovereignty um, in like an urban setting or a, a modern setting? I'm not sure they could hear. Wait, did you hear that? How? Yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. They're thinking. Yeah, uh, I, I think one of the, the easiest things you can do is, is kind of what I was getting at a little bit there is, uh, you know, even though you may be surrounded by concrete or, or wherever, you know, the, the earth is, is still there. And, and um, you know, it's it's about reconnecting with with our land. And it's, it's, it's about re- uh, um, rebuilding that relationship that we once had, you know, with our natural world it, it, and, it, and it's everywhere, you know, even to the, to the cracks in the roads and the sidewalks, you know, the earth is still breathing through those cracks and it's still there. Um, you know, sometimes it just takes you to, to put yourself in creation, you know, and, and uh, take a moment to slow down and, and, and recognize and see how beautiful this earth is and, and how uh, amazing these plants are. And they're more than just just things that we we cultivate are they're more than just things mm -hmm. that we use but they're they're actually living things you know and and they have a relationship and they deserve to live the fullness of, of life as well and i think to me that that is you know food sovereignty and that that is a an approach i think is so important is make sure that we we take the time every day to, to recognize um these beautiful things yeah i would like to add that um it's 
you know, it sounds almost like resentful on the person who asked that question that, you know, it's, I don't have that opportunity that same that, that we have up here in Northern Wisconsin, for example. And yes, it is not an all or, or nothing proposition. When I first be, became involved in this effort, like maybe 10 years ago, I mean, you go online and you can see all kinds of efforts in urban settings where they, I mean, I was, I was amazed and I was um, inspired by some of the things that you see in the cities, how people have uh, redone their whole yards, their side yards, their backyards to grow food, fruit trees, anything you can think of. I mean, it's not just because we choose to live where we are and we were born on this land, but you can have what we have anywhere. And it again, it is just like Anaquette said, just like Bishkin said, it's 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 a way of life. You, you you meditate, you take a moment to breathe and to live in the moment. I mean, that's what all of that means. It's a way of life. You live in the moment, you take in what the universe has to offer, and you be creative no matter where you are. Because it's again, it was inspiring to me to see some of those efforts that were made in urban settings in the most unlikely places. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we are moving on to the next session, so I apologize. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Anastasia, Loretta, 